warm welcome to the members of the people that are on stage with me. There's somebody, well, hey, let, let me introduce them first. Hang on, hang on. I know you're ready to, you know our friend Dr. Mills, but I'm not sure that you, everybody knows that there's somebody else on stage, her husband, Dr. Reverend, uh, Reverend Dr. Mills, as, as, yeah, oh, see that? Yeah. <laughs> And then also, of course, that's on, stay with me, on stage with us is our guest speaker, our, the Sheriff of St. Lucie County, um, Ken Mascara. So please give them a round of applause now. And let me invite Dr. Mills to greet you this morning. Good morning, everyone. I want to first of all thank your principal, Ms. Tracy Wilkins, for inviting us here and having the opportunity to bring people from all over the community here for you. Now, why do we do this? We do it because we care. We care about your success. We care about your lives. We care about our community. We want the best for our community. We want the best for your families. Most importantly, we see the, your future. We see the treasure that is in each and every one of you. And we want to make sure that you can fulfill your heart desire. We want to make sure that your dreams come true. And in order to do that, you got to put the work in. You've, you have to work hard at your dreams. Not impossible. You don't have to have be gifted and talented in a certain area. But if you work hard enough, you will succeed. I'm thinking about a story way back when I was a tutorer for a young man who couldn't read. He was already in the eighth grade, but he still struggled reading and comprehension. And I worked diligently with that young man. And many times to myself, I have to admit it, I said, I don't think he's gonna ever get this. Didn't say that to him. I continued to put the work in. Today, that young man is in his 30s. He is a graduate with his AA degree from Indian River State College. He is an extremely hard worker. He puts the work in, and he's working on his bachelor's today. You can do anything you put your mind to, and you put the work in. And so that is what I'm here to tell you. No one told me that at your age. I had to stumble through life. I didn't have people like you have coming to you today to help you think outside the box. Whatever that box is that you might live in, whatever your situation is at home, we want you to think outside the box because we know that as soon as you work on this mind and the way you think and you work hard at what you want to be, the rest is history. You'll be standing here and being one of our speakers one day and saying you graduated from Sam Gaines. So put your hands together for that, young people. Now we have a very good friend of my husband and I. Before I introduce, say something about him, uh, my husband, is this your first time being with me here, Sam Gaines? Okay, because he, he goes to Westwood and other places we travel together. But my husband has been my mate for 44 years. So young ladies, don't rush, even though I was 16 and he was 18 when we first met. I'm telling you don't rush, right? And see, I'm truthful, I'm, I'm truthful, I have to be true to myself, okay? But it worked, because we worked 
at it. Young ladies, make sure you pick the right man in life. He is a good man. And, and that's why I am here today, okay? Now, I have somebody here who has been a long time friend of ours. He has been very instrumental in helping us help the community. He has given us grants and, and uh, used his own hands to help and he has labored with us. And I'm so proud to be a friend of his. He is the top man at Rock Road. Yeah, he's the sheriff. Anybody know where Rock Road is? Okay. All orders must come from him. Nobody can do nothing without him saying it's okay to do it there. So he is the top, which, and he moved everything aside so he could be here today with you. Would you please give him another hand clap? Now before Sheriff Mascara, Ken Mascara comes up today, I want you to say a few things. I want you to speak something out with your mouth. And I want you to believe it in your heart because this is the beginning for, of the rest of your life. Today is the beginning of the rest of your life. So I want you to say it with belief. I want you to say it with strength. And I want you to be determined after you say it to do the work so that it can become a part of your life. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Yes. Okay. I want you to repeat this after me. I am strong. I am successful. I am talented. I am creative. I am wise. I am energetic. Passionate. Positive. Confident. Secure. Secure. I am prepared. Valuable. Motivated. Focus. Discipline. Determined. Patient. I'm kind. I'm generous. I'm equipped. I'm excellent. I am empowered. I am well able. I will become everything I was created to be. Because I will put the work in. I will accomplish my dreams. You young men and women. No, don't repeat that. You young men and women are fabulous. You are so special. And I am so proud to be able to be a part of this Speaker's Bureau and so proud to be a part of your lives. Put your hands together for Ken Mascara. <laughs> Sheriff Ken. Put your hands together for Dr. Mills. And she's some, yeah. You know, Dr. Mills talked about how we want you to succeed. We want to give you every tool necessary for you to become a success, but it takes a lot of perspiration, the hard work she talked about, and your success is our legacy. It's not what we do in our lives. Uh, you know, every, every once in a while I'll go somewhere and they give me a plaque, and I said, you know, these plaques don't mean much to me because when I'm gone, I know my children will throw the plaques away. They'll get a dumpster and put them somewhere, but you, as you progress in your lives, and succeed, you are our legacy, and that's what really we work for. So uh, that's what makes our life so special. How many uh, know that I've been the sheriff for a long, long time? A couple people. How many here is over 16? A few? I know a couple of the teachers are over 16, not much. Yeah? I've been sheriff for almost 16 years and it absolutely uh, astounds me that some people, uh, they were born and uh, I was sheriff and I'm still sheriff. So I've been sheriff for a long time. Uh, I was first elected in the year 2000. And when you look at me, you say, well, that guy's got everything going. He's been sheriff for 16 years. 
Everything must have been going his way. But I, like everybody in this room, have faced challenges in my life. Unlike anyone in this room, uh, we have all faced challenges in our life. And I don't know Dr. Mills gave you uh, some words to follow. I'm going to give you a sentence to follow. And when I say it, I want you to repeat it after me. The challenges that I will face can be a roadblock to my success or a stepping stone for my success. Does that make sense? No? Let me explain some roadblocks that I've had in my life. I was born right here in South Florida. Uh, my parents came to South Florida from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, way back in the 50s. My mother worked in a factory. My father worked in a factory. And they both, every morning, got up, went to work, and labored. And I can tell you, I visited both of my parents quite often in their work. And it was hard work. My mom worked in a sewing machine factory, and my father worked in a furniture factory. And uh, that hard work was instilled uh, with me as a child. Uh, coming from Pittsburgh, my dad came from steel mill families where they all worked in the steel mill, and my mother's family all had dairy farmers. So my parents could not send me to work in a steel mill to develop a worth ethic but my, uh, my parents sent me to dairy farms that my aunt and uncles owned. And at the age of seven, that was my first summer uh, that they sent me to Pennsylvania to work on a farm. Has anybody here ever worked on a farm? It's hard work, let me tell you. A dairy farm is particular hard because uh, you have to get up early in the morning to get the cows ready. Uh, usually my day started at 4.30 in the morning in which you got dressed and you had to go out and get the cows and bring them to the barn. And my goodness, if you couldn't find one cow, you would spend the rest of the day looking for. So uh, you get up at 4.30, you get the cows into the barn. The milking would start at around 5.30 or quarter to 6. And you would milk till around 8.30, at which time you stopped, cleaned everything up, and went in and had your first breakfast. Uh, breakfast lasted, and immediately when you finished, you ended up going to the fields. And in the field, you either had to plant something, pick something, or roll something up and bring it back home. Uh, and that's the way my day went every day. Uh, toward the evening at 5.30, the milking process started again. You had to go get the cows back into the barn. You milked to around 6.30 or 7.30 at night, cleaned everything up, ate dinner at 8.30, and then you went to bed. So there were 14-hour days for me as a 7-year-old boy. And I did this every summer until I was 12. And I can tell you that hard work uh, instilled something in me and all my cousins. We said we are never going to do this ever again in our lives. That's one thing we all agreed upon, that uh, the group of cousins that worked together every summer, uh, we would never be dairy farmers. We would never, ever work on a farm again. And uh, from my group of cousins, uh, all of us went to college. And I could tell you that was because working on the farm uh, showed us what happens if you don't go to college. Uh, but it was my uh, summer when I was 12 years old. How many of you are 12? 12? What grade are you in at 12? Seventh? I had just entered the eighth grade. Uh, my, uh, my summer was concluding, and I was headed for the eighth grade. I was working on the farm in Pennsylvania when my aunt uh, drove the truck out to where we were working. And she said, uh, I have to take you to the house. Your mom is on the phone. So uh, I loaded up in the truck, and she drove me to the house. And I ran into the house, and my mom was on the phone. And she said, uh, Ken, she said, I have some bad news. She said, your dad is very, very ill. And she says, you have to come home immediately. And I said, well, does that mean like tomorrow? And she said, yeah, you have to come home tomorrow. So uh, my aunt made the, res the reservations for me to get on a plane. And I was flown home, and uh, I was picked up at the airport by an uncle, which I knew then immediately was bad news because my mom would normally pick me up. And he took me to the hospital where I found my dad uh, in intensive care, and uh, I was told that most likely he would not survive. He developed a uh, bacterial infection in his blood, 
and uh, they really didn't give much of a chance to live. So uh, I stayed there with my mom at the hospital, and we went home, and my dad was in the hospital, and it's an unheard of amount of time nowadays, but when I was a child, you would hear about people spending this much time in the hospital. He was in the hospital for over three months, and uh, usually that's unheard of. So during those three months, I had to become the man of the house uh, for my mother. And I took that challenge and I used it to my advantage. I learned everything I could about uh, what my dad knew about the house. And uh, beyond all odds against all odds, after three and a half months, my dad returned home. And he came home, but he was extremely weak. Uh, he could never go back to his work. He couldn't drive. He couldn't take care of himself. And I then became his caregiver. Uh, and at the age of 12, I had to learn how to take care of my dad while my mom went to work. And this was something that I did uh, probably for a year and a half. So uh, you could see that as a young boy, young man, uh, I had challenges that a lot of people don't face. Uh, but I took those challenges and I used them uh, to learn things. I, I learned a lot about health care. I learned a lot about taking care of people and what was needed to keep people healthy. And as my mother became the breadwinner of our family, she actually progressed uh, in her company. Uh, she started off on a ground floor uh, working in a sewing factory and she progressed up the, uh, up the ladder. She became a boss of a factory. And uh, during this time that my dad was ill, her bosses actually asked her to start traveling uh, around the United States and also in Central and South America to oversee other factories. So uh, there were times that when my mom traveled, it was just my dad and me. And uh, I had to uh, continue to take care of him. And then my mom was given an unbelievable opportunity to actually oversee production of a big plant uh, in Panama. How many of you know where Panama is, right? In Central America, it's where the Panama Canal is. And my mom went there for two months, and uh, when she returned, the decision was made that her company actually wanted to move her to Panama to oversee this country. So as a family, uh, we talked, and uh, my dad, to all of our surprise, was for the move. He said even though that he was ill, uh, even though he was weak and required a lot of attention, he would be willing to move to Panama uh, so that my mom could, could take advantage of this uh, awesome opportunity. So as a family, when I was uh, 13 years old, uh, we packed everything we owned and we moved uh, to Panama, but we actually lived in Costa Rica. How many know where Costa Rica is? Yeah, Costa Rica was in Central America. I got there uh, during my eighth grade and uh, they put me into a school, a new school that uh, was taught in Spanish. Okay, do you think that was challenging for a guy entering the eighth grade who had never had a Spanish class in his life? I had to be tutored in Spanish uh, and I took this challenge in my life to uh, accept the responsibility and work to learn Spanish. I entered into a, uh, a Spanish school uh, where I went to school during the daytime, took care of my dad in the afternoon, and my mom uh, did her thing with this factory that she oversaw. The success that my mom had uh, during this time uh, was so big that the president of the company uh, actually held a dinner for my mom and, and I'm tearing up a little bit. <laughs> mm. The president of the company actually, or president of the country, uh, actually held a dinner uh, to recognize my mother's efforts. And the reason being is she took a factory that had about 100 workers and uh, expanded it to almost 1,500 workers. Uh, so 1,400 people who didn't have jobs uh, became productive citizens of their life. And after this big expansion uh, of the factory and these people uh, went to work and the factory became successful, um, 
my mother's time was done and it was time for us to come home. And I returned uh, to St. Lucie County uh, because uh, my dad had an uncle here and we thought with uh, a support structure of my dad's family, we could continue to take care of him. And we returned to St. Lucie County in 1975. So let me just go back here. In the eighth grade, I was taken to a foreign country where I had to learn Spanish uh, and succeed in school. And then as I was entering my senior year, uh, as a senior, they pulled me out of my school and I came here to Fort Pierce uh, where I entered Fort Pierce Central. How many of y'all plan on going to Fort Pierce Central? Yay, Cobras, right? <laughs> what is it? Yeah, for some yes, some no, huh? So again, I was faced with a challenge, a new school, new friends, uh, making my inways uh, to, uh, to the administration of the school. And I took this opportunity uh, again to succeed in school. I studied hard. Uh, I tried out for the baseball team and actually made the baseball team. There was nothing more than I wanted to be in life than a baseball, professional baseball player. However, during my third game, I actually blew my left knee out, uh, which prevented me going on any further. Uh, but during this time, I concentrated on my studies. Um, and I studied hard and I worked hard. I graduated near the top of my class at Fort Pierce Central, class of 1976, which is a long, long time ago. And uh, upon graduation, I always had this, uh, this uh, goal or dream to be in law enforcement. And right out of high school, uh, I went down and applied to the Fort Pierce Police Department, but they refused to hire me because I was too young. Uh, so I said, well, how old do I have to be and what, what qualities do I have to be for you to, for you to hire me? And they said, well, we've never hired anyone under the age of 21. And I said, but I'm going to work hard and I'm going to do uh, all the things you want me to do. And uh, I've never used drugs and I've never smoked and I've been an athlete. I'm in great shape. And they said, no, nope, we won't hire you until you're 21. So I, I thought that was a roadblock. I, I never thought uh, that I could wait three years to, to enter law enforcement. So I went to the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office and I put an application in. And they said, you know what? We've never hired anyone who was right out of high school, uh, but we will give you a shot at working here if you want to go work in the jail. I've never been at a jail in my life, never really knew where the jail was. And I said, you know what? Uh, I could use this as an obstacle to my success, or I could use this jail for a stepping stone for my success. So I said, you know what? If you're willing to take a chance on me and put me in the jail, I'll go to work in the jail. And at the age of 18, one of the youngest ever at the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, I went to work at the St. Lucie County Jail. The jail was located on 2nd Street, right where the uh, current courthouse is. And at age 18, I walked behind that green door and they slammed it and I was scared to death. Uh, but I used that opportunity to succeed. While working, I went to college, uh, took classes, uh, in criminal justice, thought my entire career was in front of me. I was only in the jail nine months, which is unheard of, when the then sheriff came to me and said, listen, uh, we want to actually take you out of the jail and put you in, into investigations uh, in the drug unit. And I said, well, I, I really don't know much about drugs. I don't, I don't know how to do investigations. And they said, well, we have a lot of confidence in you. We think that you'll, you'll make it. And um, I was brought out of the jail, uh, put undercover with our drug unit, and I worked there for about six months, uh, made a tremendous amount of arrest, and then they came to me and said, well, it's now time that we're going to put you on the road in uniform uh, as a deputy. And to be honest with you, I was scared to death. Uh, I know that deputies uh, on the road that, that drive green and white patrol cars face danger every day. Uh, I was still only 19 years old now, uh, didn't know if I wanted to do this or not, but I said, you know what, this is an opportunity for me to succeed in my career. So I went ahead and immediately went to the road uh, from undercover investigations, and I thought my entire career was in front of me. Everything was going great until uh, September of 1979. 
I'll never forget it. Uh, I was uh, making arrest on an individual and uh, he ran from me. I lost him inside of a building and unbeknownst to me, he was hiding, waiting for me uh, to enter where he was and uh, he hit me with a two by four and uh, he knocked me down and it wasn't, it wasn't enough that he knocked me down. Uh, he stood over me with this board and just, just beat me senseless. And uh, he got up and he ran off and it was only because of some other deputies that had come later that they arrested this individual. But because of that, I suffered a broken back. Uh, that assault resulted in a broken back for me. I was taken off uh, the road and uh, I was actually uh, put in a hospital uh, preparing for them to do surgery on me. And uh, a lady that ha happens to work at the sheriff's office came in and said, you know what? Uh, I don't think you should have this surgery. Maybe you should consider something else because once you have back surgery, things don't always turn out the way you want. Usually there's a lot of complications. So I took it upon myself to educate myself about the back. I educated myself about rehabilitation and I ended up uh, going to a physical therapy center and a chiropractic physician. And uh, between those two, after around three or four months of treatment, I actually returned back to work. And uh, they never thought I would return back to work. And I was so moved by the treatment that I had received to get better that I actually changed the entire focus of my life from law enforcement to the medical field. I actually then wanted to become a doctor. And everybody who I told this story to, they looked at me and said, there's no way. You've been in law enforcement for four years. You've worked in the jail. You've been a deputy. Uh, there's no way that you can become a doctor. And I said, you know what? That's exactly what I want to hear because I'm going to prove you wrong. And I could have used all, everything that they said to me as an obstacle, but I didn't. I used it as motivation. I went back to college. Uh, I finished my AA in medicine, not criminal justice. I went on and got uh, undergraduate work in medicine and I entered college. And in 1984, uh, I became a chiropractic physician after three years of college. I opened up. <clears throat> and and what's, what's ironic of this, some of the people who told me I would never be a doctor, never be a physician, those people were my patients. Uh, so, so uh, it shows you how life can change. And I was a chiropractic physician opening up my office in 1984. Uh, I had a tremendous practice. I was uh, a, a big part of the community in Port St. Lucie. And uh, right when I thought everything was going fantastic in my life, uh, September 28th of 1996, I was involved in a motorcycle accident. Um, it was a very uh, freak accident. The, uh, it was raining outside. I was not wearing a helmet. Uh, I was attempting to slow down for a car in front of me and the motorcycle slipped on the wet pavement. I slid under the car and my arm, my left arm was up like this in an effort to brace myself. And when I slid under the car, it just about ripped my left arm off. So um, I was picked up, loaded to the hospital, Taken, uh, taken to Lawnwood right here uh, where the doctor came in and said, uh, your left arm is, is pretty broken up. We're going to have to do surgery on it and uh, we're going to schedule that surgery for tomorrow. And they said, we, we know who you are. <laughs> You're a chiropractic physician. You need your arms. And the doctor said, we're going to try to do everything we can to make sure your arm stays on. Now, as someone in my shoes who had a very successful career using this arm as part of my, my business, you can imagine what I felt. So I had surgery. I have uh, pins and rods that were put in my arm. And uh, I went through probably six or seven months of rehab. And uh, the doctor said, I think you can go back to work. And I said, oh my gosh, I've been praying for this day since, uh, since the accident. And I went back to work in April uh, of 1979, 79 or 80, I can't remember. 
89, that's right, thank you. 1989, went back to work, uh, saw a couple of patients, really didn't do much with my left arm. And I'll be darned, before lunch, I had a patient that I was working on and my left arm broke and one of the rods cracked in my arm. So I loaded me back up, took me back to the same doctor, uh, opened me back up, replaced one of the rods and he sat me down, looked me square in the eyes. He says, your career is over said you can never go back to work. Uh, because of what you do, the rods that are in your arm, the screws that are in your arm just can't take the torque and the pressure of what you do. So I said, Doc, I said, I've been doing this for 15 years. What am I going to do? He says, well, he says, you're going to have to do something else, but you can't do this. So I took it upon myself to go back and reinvent myself. I returned to college, uh, learned everything I could about law enforcement, I actually went back and got my bachelor's degree in criminal justice, something I'd never had, uh, and decided to run for sheriff in 2000. The year was 2000. Uh, many of you weren't born, correct? You weren't even born in 2000. Um, but I ran for sheriff in 2000, was elected in November of 2000, and I've been sheriff ever since, which is now coming up almost on 16 years. This November will be 16 years. Now, many of you say, well, now that he's sheriff, he's probably sitting back in a lazy boy, really not looking for anything else. But you know what? History in my life says as soon as things starts going good, something is going to happen. So during these past 16 years, I've worked hard and prepared myself for the next chapter in my life. And I really don't know what that next chapter is going to bring. Uh, am I going to go and do consulting work? as a physician? I don't know. Am I, am I going to go and do other work as a physician? Uh, I don't know. But one thing that I can tell you, for the past 16 years, I've gone back to college. I've taken classes in uh, business. I've taken classes in accounting. I've taken classes in insurance. And uh, what I am now becoming is, uh, to other sheriffs in the state of Florida, I've become an expert on things that they might need in regard to business and or insurance for their offices. And just, uh, just last November, I was voted by my peers of sheriffs, there are 67 sheriffs in the state of Florida, I was voted as the chairman of the board of our insurance fund. Our insurance fund oversees insurance for 65 of the 67 sheriffs in Florida. Our assets are just uh, just over a half a billion dollars, just over $500 million. And as chairman of the board, I actually manage that money for my fellow sheriffs and put it in places uh, to protect them against lawsuits uh, or anything else that might occur in their office. So as I conclude today, my life, like Dr. Mill's life, like her husband's life, like your principal's life, like your teacher's lives, like your lives, are going to have lots of obstacles. There are going to be things that are going to be thrown at you that you could have never, ever, ever thought of. There are going to be things that you will need to face that you never thought you would have to face. But take all those things that are thrown at you that you will face as opportunities. Don't let them hold you down. Don't anything uh, that ever comes in your life be something that stops your success. So I conclude by starting, by closing the way we started. I want you to repeat after me. The challenges that I will face in life can be obstacles to my success. or stepping stones for my success. Always invest in yourselves. Always go to school, continue learning, and God bless you all and be the success that you are deemed to be. Thank you. Yeah, so you did good? Oh, you did. The sheriff just asked me if he did good. Did he do good? You know, there was something that you said, uh, and that was that 
you are a lifetime learner. Lifetime learner. We never get too old to say, I don't have to learn anymore. There is so much that there is in life to learn. And um, the other thing that the sheriff said was those obstacles that come. You are young people. You know, he became sheriff in 2000. None of you were born at that time. There's a whole path for you in life right now. And based on your decisions, it will lead you in the direction of your decisions. He made several choices, several decisions as he came up on those obstacles. And instead of giving up, never, never give up. If I told you some of the obstacles I've had to endure, you would wonder how in the world did she get through that and she's here today as a St. Lucie County School Board member. You would not believe the obstacles I've had to face in life. But I am currently right now in school. So just because I got a doctorate in something doesn't mean, okay, now I'm finished and I don't have to go any further. I am currently taking several classes online classes and will continue to get training and get classes. I don't care how old I get. When you have that type of attitude, nothing can stop you. I'm telling you, nothing at all. You heard things that he went through, the motorcycle crash, that he went through, the breaking of his back. I mean, things that normally people just, some people, give up. But instead, he just chose a different career. He wanted to be a baseball player. That didn't pan out. But he did not give up. So the message today is never, never. You got it. Ms. Wilkie, it's in your hands. Thank you. You're beautiful. You're wonderful children. Wow, what a positive, powerful message from both of our speakers this morning that you got to hear. Please thank them again.